Welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our Freshwater Stewardship Community Webinar. You'll notice as you come in that we're making sure everyone's cameras and microphones are muted just to save as much bandwidth as possible. But if you think of any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat. And while we're waiting for a couple more people to enter the room, feel free to drop in the chat where you're tuning in from today. All right, it is one o'clock, so we'll get started here. We're really excited to have Erin with us today as our keynote presenter. She's the director of the Female Anglers of Manitoba. And we also have a couple of staff members from Watersheds Canada. My name is Nicole, I'm the Freshwater Health Coordinator. And we also have Monica, who is the Communications and Fundraising Manager. And Monica is here to help you if you have any tech problems or questions about Zoom, you can feel free to send her a private message. Now, just a little bit about Watersheds Canada. Watersheds Canada is a nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario. And we deliver programs across the country in partnership with landowners, community groups, kids who are looking to take action to protect local freshwater. So on the screen, you can see some photos of a couple of our different programs. So on the top left is our Natural Edge program. And in this program, we work with community groups and shoreland owners to naturalize their property using native plants. And then on the bottom left, we have our Love Your Lake program, which is delivered in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And this program is a shoreline evaluation program where we fill out an assessment for each property and give uh, each property owner custom recommendations about voluntary actions that they can take to protect the health of the lake. And then you can see on the top right is our fish habitat restoration program. So in this program, we work with community groups to lead projects uh, such as walleye and trout spawning bed restorations, cold water creek enhancements, and adding woody debris with brush bundle projects. And then finally on the bottom, you can see our nature discovery programming. And this is an outreach program for children and youth. And we help them safely explore nature And now the program that we're all here for today, which is our Freshwater Stewardship Community, which launched in 2021. And we have most of our webinars archived on our website. So you can find 43 webinars and 38 handouts all online on our website, which is watersheds.ca slash freshwater stewardship. So I'd encourage you to check those out after today. Um, there's webinars from the private sector, other nonprofits, and academia, which cover a wide range of topics all related to freshwater health. And we'd also like to thank the ECHO Foundation, Peterborough KM Hunter Charitable Foundation, and the SM Blair Family Foundation for their funding support this year. So here's an example of one of the handouts that I mentioned from a previous webinar. And after this webinar, you can expect to receive a handout like this in your inbox, and it will share all the key information from Aaron's presentation and provide additional resources so you can take action after today's presentation. And then also in that email, you'll receive a recording of today's uh, webinar as well. And I'm excited to let you know about another webinar that's coming up this month. So next week, we will have a webinar about using underwater cameras to detect detect freshwater fish. So that's happening on next Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And so again, you can head to our website and find more information about upcoming web webinars and then also register for webinars there. And now a little bit more about our speaker for today. Erin is a lifelong multi-species angler, waterfowl hunter, and outdoor enthusiast who loves to encourage people, especially women and kids, to use fishing as a tool for exploring the outdoors and building self-confidence. Erin's favorite adventures have always been centered around camping and fishing with her family and friends. Ensuring that natural spaces can be enjoyed for generations to come is important to Erin, and she enjoys educating people on the proper practices to ensure released fish have the best chance of survival and fish kept for food are harvested using ethical practices. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Erin. 
Okay. Hi. Um, I'm just getting used to Zoom here. I'm just, uh, let's see, get my screen shared. All right. I hope everybody can see that and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, are we good there, Nicole and Monica? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you're all set. Excellent. Um, okay, so um, this presentation is focused mostly towards really new anglers um, and new ice anglers. I hope that if you are experienced that you still get a little bit of a takeaway of information from this, but um, that's, that's kind of my goal is to encourage and inspire new people to get out there and try new things and explore the outdoors through angling. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, let's see here. Oh my gosh. Sorry, folks. Okay, so um, I am the director of Female Anglers of Manitoba. And um, there's my contact information. I'll show you, share it again at the end. Um, and if anyone needs to get a hold of me or has any questions after the fact, please feel free to reach out. Um, and gosh, I'm not sure if you can hear that. My computer's doing something crazy. <laughs> so here's some photos from some of our previous female angler events. This is uh, the Crowduck Lake Camp event and from September of 2022. Back in... Gosh, 2016, we started this out as just a weekend getaway for some ladies to get out there, explore, try a new lake, meet some new people who also share that common interest and have a lot of fun. And it became so much more than that. Um, we're now a grassroots organization aimed to inspire, encourage, empower and enable women to do all those things. Use the outdoors as an excuse and a reason to explore and um yeah use use angling as as a way to find new new spaces to to check out sorry guys <laughs> um i am let's see here never mind sorry we'll skip that um our next event is our ladies learn to ice fish day and i'm teaming up with shauna Lowe on this event um she is um fairly well known on social media for her uh, angling accom accomplishments as well. Um, and this will be on February 25th at Lockport. Um, we're going to be covering pretty well anything you need to know to get out there and either um, help out more with the folks that you do go with or have the confidence to be able to go on your own um, and ideally build up enough so that you can take your kiddos and uh, myself, I go, I just take my two girls. My husband isn't really into fishing very much. So I take my girls and we go and we have a great time and we catch lots of fish and it's lots of fun. So yeah, winter can be long. Thankfully this year is not one of those. We, I think pretty well across Canada, other than now in the Maritimes are getting a ton of snow, but, uh, there's, uh, a lot less, frigid than normal um and personally a little secret is i actually hate winter um but i love ice fishing so it's kind of a conundrum there but uh yeah if you if you choose like my sign says here if you choose not to find the joy in the snow you'll have less joy in your life but still the same amount of snow um and ice fishing is actually one of the easiest ways to introduce kids to ice fishing or to fishing in general just because there's there's no casting involved you're not in a boat you're not you know, trolling, there's a lot less chances of lines getting tangled and a lot, lot less um, frustrations in that aspect. It's just kind of like drop the line down the hole, find the bottom and go from there. Um, you can also get to a lot of different places that you wouldn't necessarily be able to unless you had a boat. Um, so being able to just walk across the ice to some of those deeper places or other uh structures on the on the water body that you're at is a, a huge advantage over open water as far as rules and regulations make sure you get familiar with them before you head out you are the one responsible for knowing the rules for the water body that you're visiting um, of course there's going to be limits there's slot sizes there's license requirements um, um, tackle and bait rules and of course these can vary from year to year and from season to season 
A uh, good example of how it can vary season to season is here in Manitoba, you are allowed two rods for ice fishing, but only one for open water fishing. So make sure that you are familiar with those. Um, there's no excuses if a conservation officer pops by your fishing spot. So you better have um, all your, your ins and outs covered and make sure that you're checking official sources for those rules and not just word of mouth from other anglers or Facebook pages or stuff because some people like to pull your leg just for the fun of it. So make sure you're getting the, the full story from official information on those rules. Um, I'm sure every ice fishing presentation has this thickness chart on it. Um, and of course the ice thickness recommendations are based on solid, clear ice. Um, ice is never a hundred percent safe. I don't want to scare anybody, but it's true. Um, it, it's a floating mass. It's not necessarily, uh, connected really. It's, it's more buoyant than it is strong. Um, and as you're heading out there, you're going to be wanting to check your ice as you go. Um, there's different types of ice. And like I said, there's the, the clear solid ice is your kind of gold standard of ice, but there's ice that forms as sort of a frozen slush when layers of snow kind of mix in with the water as it's freezing. There's ice that will form a thin layer and then break up and it can go into plates and uh, as it's moving around and stack and then refreeze. Um, those areas are frustrating for ice fishing because when you try to drill through those sorts of um, structures in ice with your auger, it's more likely to get stuck. So you want to look for that clear, hard ice. Um, and uh, that's anything anything other than that, you're going to want to add a few inches on to your recommended thicknesses. Um, also consider snow as an insulator, especially in very, very early season. Um, you can get a skim of snow over a piece of ice and where it's sort of patchy. So you'll have clear ice and then a little fluff of snow. And you might think, oh, well, that fluff of snow is probably thicker. It's holding it up. No, not necessarily. That snow could be insulating that ice and there could be absolutely zero structural integrity to the ice under that little patch of snow. So make sure that you have a spud bar, some other strong way of testing the ice in front of you as you go, um, especially early season. I'm personally never the first one out on the ice. I'm uh, definitely a follower in that sense. Um, around here, it's usually the commercial fishers who are out first um, and they are much braver than I. Um, it's really important if you are gonna be one of those first people out that you are watching what's happening out there constantly because everything can change very, very quickly. Um, when you're heading out on the ice, you wanna avoid marshy areas at shorelines. Um, the biological processes that happen in those sorts of spaces can create warmer pockets and um, at the ice doesn't freeze necessarily the same way in those areas. So. Um, again, that clear, uh, thick or clear solid ice is what you're looking for. Um, as you're out there, temperature, wind, and wind chill will play a big factor into your comfort levels um, and just the safety in general. Um, making sure that you have a shelter, making sure that um, you're out of the wind. A good example is uh, around here a couple days ago, it was really warm. It was about four or five degrees outside, but that wind, gosh, it bit. It was just, it, it tore right through and it felt like it was a standard winter day, even though it was in the plus temperatures. So the wind can really change things for you out there. Um, and of course, um, visibility is really important too, and things can change quickly in that regard. You um, will need to make sure that you can get back to shore, obviously. So to keep that in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit more about those sorts of things in some upcoming slides as well. You'll have some good examples of what what it can look like out there. Um, when you are using a shelter, carbon and a, and a fuel source, uh, carbon monoxide is a concern. It's a good idea to, especially if you're taking an overnight trip, to have a carbon monoxide detector with you. 
And those aren't all standard either. There are some that are calibrated strictly for indoor temperatures uh, in the, you know, the 20 degrees or so. Um, and it's a good idea that if you are going to be doing an outside ice overnight trip, that you have one that's more, that's calibrated for a variety of temperatures that you could in, uh, encounter in your ice shack or your shelter. Um, you want to make sure that your vehicle that you're using, if you are using one, is reliable. It, it should start no problem. You should have all of your fluids topped up, all of everything good to go. Make sure you, if it has 4 by 4 that that's working um, and that there are no leaks because we don't want to be leaking any uh, fluids into the water body that we're visiting. And of course, like any other uh, outdoor adventure adventure you want to be making sure that you're telling somebody your plan where you're going how long you're going to be there who's with you when you're going to be back um, your ideal route or area that you plan on being in um, and and all that kind of stuff just any other pertinent information keep in contact with somebody on the shore if possible um, and just let them know how things are going So that's our safety for you and now safety for the fish. Um, everybody, myself included, can do better at fish handling. Um, I have a couple of examples here in my photos of what not to do if you're releasing fish. Um, the picture on the left there is a little walleye with frozen eyes and crispy frozen fins. That one obviously went home with us. Same with this little pike on the other side. That guy, um, I, you can see I have my thumb right around his, uh, his gut area and squeezing a fish is certainly not a good thing for it. Um, that little guy went home with us too <laughs> because we do enjoy our, our fish for supper. Um, but uh, yeah, so just don't hold them by the eyes. Don't stick your fingers in their gills. Uh, make sure that the release happens as uh, quickly as possible. You can do your your photo or your measurement, um, but if uh, if at all possible, just make sure that uh, you're, you're protecting that fish because they are the future of the fishery. Uh, any fish that gets back down there safely has a chance to go and reproduce and make some more for you to catch later. Um, yeah, and again, cold and wind chill um, have a big factor in that um, tent, having a tent or a shelter really helps to reduce the impact of the cold weather on the fish. But if you're outside, um, chances are that it's it's better to even just hold the fish in the hole in the water before you bring it out for a photo and then just straight back into the hole and, uh, and release it after that. Um, when you're harvesting fish, you wanna make sure that they aren't suffering. So, um, this is kind of something that there's a lot of conversation about and like the best way to do that. Um, some people will do the bonk method and some will um, do a slit and bleed them out. And that uh, often will result in a much paler colored and less fishy tasting fillet. So that's typically one of the things that I'll do if I have the tools to do that with me, which I usually do. Um, but yeah, so it's just a, little note on that um let's see here oh yes barotrauma so fishing too deep can cause a lot of stress on the fish um i've seen it where when i was little especially i don't do it anymore but if you're fishing really deep this uh, fish's swim bladder can actually pop out of the fish's mouth <laughs> and that fish is probably not going to do so well after that so um if you do see that happening, you might want to reconsider the space that you're fishing in, um, find some some shallower water. And, and this can happen too, just by maybe you're only fishing in you know 17 feet of water, but that fish recently came from 30 and is just up in that 17 to feed. So they and you together have created a situation where there is a barotrauma effect, but um, you're not necessarily going to know that right off the bat. So that's kind of where um, it's a good idea to always be prepared to take fish home if you're uh, ideally catch and, catch and release fishing. But uh, if there is significant damage to the fish, then it's definitely better for you to, to take them home and enjoy them rather than sending it back down just to die. And of course, different species are... Um, 
sensitive at different levels. Um, some fish are much tougher and some are definitely weaklings when it comes to um, shock and surviving after a traumatic experience. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, apologies in advance for this Manitoba specific sl slide here, um, but this just gives you an idea of the different watersheds in Manitoba and the immense number of opportunities there are to find different species and explore different areas. There's um, great ways to hone in on those areas depending on where you live, where you're planning on, on, on getting to. Um, and it seems like each of those areas have Facebook groups that you can join in and, and get local information. So I just have a list of a few little ones here um, to mention that always have handy information, at least for Manitoba. Uh, use that Facebook search bar, find your area that you're uh, planning on attending and uh, start digging for information that way. It's, it's really handy. Um, you can get information on all the different access points and uh, the areas that are producing at the time. And that's, yeah, part of deciding, so where to fish. Again, what kind of adventure do you have or do you want to have? Um, the safety of the area that you're going to, your travel time, your target species, the accesses to the fishable areas, and just your own situation, because you're probably not walking three miles if you have a toddler with you. Um, Drive-on accesses are limited for wheeled vehicles sometimes. Sometimes you need a, a tracked vehicle in order to get out. Um, and so that can limit your choices in, in where you're heading out to. Um, as far as where the fish say that you should be, um, you are going to find fish where their needs are being met because that's where they're going to be. Um, you'll have to consider each individual species and its habitat, its habits, um, its uh, just feeding habits and all those sorts of things. Um, you're going to want to look for uh, water that's oxygenated, but of course you're going to want to stay away from aerators um, and fast current and spillways. Those areas of move moving water don't really freeze the same way and sometimes not at all. So giving a, a wide berth to those areas is, is very important for your safety. Um, when you're looking for places to fish, Structure is important. Um, fish tend to like rocks and weed lines. Um, even in the winter, those weed lines will exist for a little bit after the ice starts to form, they will start to die out, but that general area still remains. So that's something that you can look for. Um, and then depth contours on a lake like Lake Winnipeg, where it's mostly a sandy bowl, but there are contours of depths. Um, the fish will sometimes move across those and sometimes move along them. So kind of analyzing where you've seen them or where you've uh, encountered them, you can uh, hone in on, on what some of their patterns can be, but it changes all the time. And of course, fish live where their food is, and that is very species specific. So um, again, knowing about your target species is going to really help you hone in on where they could be. Uh, typically, bait fish don't like to be in cloudy water. It's hard for them to to breathe, um, and they'll they'll seek clear and um, yeah, just clear water. So if you're drilling a hole, for example, on a river or something like that, and you see just muck, kind of dirty, cloudy water come up, uh, it's maybe not even a good good idea to stay in that area. You might want to try to move somewhere else. Um, and of course, if you have a sonar, you can check it first, but avoiding cloudy water will help your chances a lot. Um, and thinking about the food that each of those fish eat will dictate kind of where your bait presentation should go. So crustaceans, insects, larvae, those are always, are almost always at the bottom in the rocks or um, like near the, the edges of like mossy, weedy sorts of um, and then, of course, your predatory fish can be right under the ice. Um, usually, if I'm setting a tip up for pike, it'll only be a foot or two under the ice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, geez, yeah, so 
go for go for the species that you're going for and look, looking at the biology of your target is uh, going to help you a lot. Maps are a huge resource and there's so many different mapping apps out there and uh, different ways of getting those maps. Uh, a lot of your sonars or electronics will have those built in. Of course, everybody with the phone in their pocket can get any of the apps that are available. So Avenza has the Angler's Edge mapping and that's the, the colorful map that I have in the background of this slide. They are really doing a lot of um, mapping and, and uh, scouting in, in Manitoba right now. I think they're expanding to more areas. I, they've got big plans, it's awesome. Um, and their maps are so detailed, so colorful, um, definitely worth checking out. Um, Navionics is another great mapping app. There's iBoating Marine Navigation. I've heard there's a lot of free ones on there. Um, I haven't explored it too, too much because I do like the Angler's Edge maps myself. Um, the iHunter app is also really good with contours and different um, uh, topographical sort of information. And then, of course, lodges and outfitters will have maps for any of the lakes that they are operating on. Okay, so a few quick tips for traveling on the ice. Um, it's It can be intimidating, but it's not that bad once you kind of know what to look for. Um, one of the first things to notice is, or to note is um, a lot of people travel way too fast on the ice. Um, it's not a highway. It is floating. Um, and you can end up pushing a wave sort of underneath your, your vehicle as you travel. Um, when the wave reaches either a pressure ridge or a shoreline, it needs somewhere to go. So it can cause buckling or um, it can cause heaving in the ice. Uh, ideally, you're not driving on ice when it's at the minimal thicknesses, but if you are, then you have to be much more aware of that situation. Um, and especially when you're approaching other vehicles as well. So both vehicles have to be going reasonably uh, slow, but still not too slow so that you don't get stuck. There's, there's kind of a fine line there. <laughs> Um, buddy up when you can, um, especially when you're likely to get stuck. Have your shovels and recovery straps ready and know where to attach them to your vehicle. A uh, big safety thing that a lot of um, you see a lot of posts of or you know mishaps that happen is people will just loop the end of their recovery strap over the hitch ball. Now those things can break off, especially when you're giving a bit of a tug and there's a, a shock involved. You, you don't want any of those sorts of things going through any of your windows or I've seen pictures of them embedded in tailgates um, it's an, or, or grills. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to have to deal with that. So um, loop your uh, recovery strap through your hit, your receiver hitch, and then use the pin through the, through the recovery strap loop instead of putting it over top of, of the ball. Um, also, on, depending on your own, your specific vehicle, making sure that those um, attachment points are, are accessible and that you know where they are ahead of time is, is important. And yeah, don't use chains for that same kind of reason as they can break and fly through things. It's quite dangerous. Use your GPS to, to navigate. navigate. Oh, gosh. Um, you can track your trail as you go out so that you have an exact path to head home through. Um, trails can blow in while you're out there. Um, there's often no landmarks. As you can see in this picture here, this is Lake Winnipeg. You, there's a few little um, sticks that you can see out there, and that's the snowmobile trail, the Mark Snowman Trail. And really, that is sometimes the only landmark that you get. Um, so having GPS is really helpful in navigating out there, especially on cloudy days when there's no shadows and it's really easily easy to, to lose track of your trail or of just the depth of the snow in general. It's really hard to tell. And conditions can change quickly. So you have to be paying attention. If you're in your shack or uh, other shelter, 
make sure you're popping your head out and looking out the window and just seeing if things are changing because it can be a matter of minutes before you can't really see. So make sure you have the, the forecast in mind. Um, there's um, more apps that are really good. I like the uh, the Windy app and the Wind Finder, I believe it's called. Um, just, yeah, looking at forecasts will, will give you a lot of information because extreme visibility is not fun to be traveling in on a lake. Um, here's another shot of something you can run into at an access. Um, and it's hard to tell what what that really is. So you got to get out, you got to look. Um, anytime you're not sure about something that you're approaching, just check. Use your spud bar, use the other tools that you have available, shovels. Um, make sure, like, make sure you're checking before you cross that. Just avoid avoid problems. And sometimes it's easier just to say, not today, instead of fighting for hours, shoveling out of getting stuck. Um, shallow areas and shorelines are the first things to break down in the spring. Um, so in this picture, you can kind of see this is the Warner Road access um, at uh, Lake Winnipeg. And this always ends up like this first thing in the spring. Now that water is really only three inches, four inches deep, but it's hard to tell. And there's certainly a lot of areas, um, Manitoba and all across Canada, where that distance off of the shore could easily be 100 feet of water. So making sure that you're, you're checking and uh, again, using those tools before you go anywhere near anything that looks a little bit sketchy. And what goes down on the ice must go back up. Even though this doesn't look like a big hill, this vehicle did not want to go up it. So um, again, knowing how to secure your, your straps and how to get out of a situation like this is important to be prepared for. I don't want to scare anybody, of course, but just knowing what can happen and being aware and being prepared for it is a lot of the battle sometimes because a lot of these problems are easy to fix. Um, they are time consuming. And of course, weather will definitely play a factor into how difficult or comfortable it's going to be doing that. But um, yeah, preparedness is key. Oops. Okay, so you're packing and getting ready for a trip. Um, you're taking your kiddos. What do you have to do? Um, ideally, you're going to be getting them involved a long time before the trip um, so that they are planning the trip with you. You want to know what they want to target. You want to know what kind of extras and toys they want to take along. You want to know if you're meeting up with friends or family or anything like that along the way. Um, coordinating those things is uh, definitely going to add to the fun and the memories of the day. Um, you want to make sure that the preparation is done so that you're spending your ice time actually fishing. You don't want to be rigging up pickerel rigs and um, when your hands are cold and maybe a little bit wet or whatever, um, and your kid is saying, but mom, I just want to fish. Where, what, is it ready yet? Can I fish? Can I fish? Yeah, not the time to be pulling gear out of packages. It's best to have that all ready to go ahead of time. Of course, prepare for wet hands and feet. Always have extra socks and mitts. I'm probably going to say that a few times throughout the rest of this. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. Um, just, yeah, all the, all the extras, because kids are definitely going to get wet, and uh, you want to maximize your time out there. Another tip for maximizing your time is to, especially on a long drive, don't put all of your layers on right away. Um, gear up enough that you're comfortable on the drive, but don't get sweaty on the drive, because as soon as you're sweaty and then you go out into the cold, you're going to get cold a lot faster. So. Just uh, use those layers and uh, move, go up and down in layers as you need. Um, tie your knots ahead of time. Learn them. Know what to do because when your fingers are frozen, <laughs> it's a lot harder to tie anything. Um, and your dexterity is definitely not as good as it would be. So make sure that you're comfortable tying some good solid knots. 
I, I figured with Valentine's coming up that this uh, slide on the right here is kind of cute. So nothing is stronger than love except polymer knots. Um, that one's my favorite one to teach to beginners. It's really, really simple and it's really, really strong. And you can use it on pretty much any type of uh, fishing gear. So feel free to screenshot this for reference. I think it'll end up in the handouts that are going to be coming through after the presentation. Um, it's just a quick list of the gear musts, maybes, and some fun extras. Um, and of course, not all of these things are going to apply to every trip. And there's definitely going to be things that will apply to you that may not be on this list. So just kind of a basic to start from. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I'll just kind of like touch a few points here. So over here, I have to make sure that you have a good metal shovel or two. So plastic breaks at minus 40. It's just a simple fact. Make sure that your shovel is metal. Um, and uh, you, you certainly don't want to be taking your first good stroke at uh, drift and end up with a thousand pieces of plastic and nothing to get you out with. Um, and I say a shovel or two because it's always good to have an extra A if something happens to that first one or B if you have someone else with you who can help you shovel or if somebody by just by chance and luck comes and sees that you're stuck and wants to help you out, then you have something to offer them to actually help you with. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, and um, a note on the music, like that's kind of an etiquette thing. Don't go too loud unless you know you're absolutely the only one on the lake. And then it's, of course, up to you. But um, it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea to be listening to someone else's music from a little bit, of, like even a few hundred yards away. So keep it on on a reasonable volume. And uh, but yeah, definitely you know, music is awesome to have out when you're ice fishing. And if you take a puppy dog with you, um, yeah, sorry. I'm just, um, if you take your puppy dog with you, make sure you have something with um, like with you for them to stay off the ice with, whether that's their pet bed or just a blanket or um, even the car mat from your the floor, the backseat of your car, but just anything to keep their feet up and off the ice because they'll get cold too really quickly too. Uh, I know that budgets are really important for people, especially these days. Um, so I've kind of gotten a budget friendly list of equipment here. Um, I am definitely a frugal person. Um, so I've, I, I look for, for deals and things like that and, and ways to do things without spending a ton of money, especially for people who are just getting into ice angling. There's, there's key things that you do need, but you don't have to break the bank. Um, I'm not in the business of of selling anything to anybody, so that's kind of where I have an advantage, and I can just say, yeah, you can you can be cheap, and you can catch fish, and it's totally fine, and it doesn't matter if somebody laughs at you because you're gonna get fish, and you didn't spend a pile of money. Um, your auger is probably your most expensive first investment. Um, you can use a metal spud bar or a hatchet in early season. But once you get to the two, three, four feet of ice, um, even a hand auger isn't exactly ideal. Um, you're going to want to go with, uh, there's some really good electric augers out there now. Um, personally, I still have a gas auger and I probably will forever. Um, of course, make sure that it's not leaking or uh, making any kind of, you know, it's not leaking any fluids onto the ice, but um yeah, it's going to be reliable. I find it's better than than trusting batteries, which you have to keep warm and they have to be charged. Um, I'm maybe just a little too disorganized to take good care of batteries. <laughs> but yeah, I, I prefer the gas auger, but there's definitely a lot of other options out there that will get you where you need to go. There's even um, just auger flights that you can add to a standard, like a, a drill. Um, they do have to have certain torque requirements in order to actually run the, the auger, but, um, oh, sorry, there's something pop up here. Um, but uh, yeah, there are things that you can add on an auger to your drill without adding the full expense, like several hundred dollars. 
uh, especially if you already have that the, the power tools in in your in your shop or whatever. Um, okay, so for rods, I get laughed at for this, but I love it. I use an old, or at least until I was maybe my mid twenties, I used a broken chunk of hockey stick um, with a couple nails in each end and some tip up line wrapped around it. And that, that was my rod. That's how, what I grew up with using um, from as a little kid up until my mid twenties. Um, and I still have it out there with the kids, especially because it's um, a solid thing. It's not going to go down the hole. Uh, and if it does, it really doesn't cost me anything. Every single community center rink outdoor thing has broken hockey sticks laying around. Uh, you can usually just go and grab one, cut it into a couple chunks and away you go. Of course, the classic baits still work. Um, there are, of course, 16, 18, 20 dollar uh, lures out there that you can get, um, but spoons, jigs, pickerel rigs, the the El Cheapo stuff still definitely catches fish. Um, and as far as your shelter goes, that is entirely um, a huge range of, of what you could spend. Um, of course, Marketplace and any of those other used sites are a really great place to look for that sort of thing because some people will upgrade and resell their old equipment. And you can get it for much cheaper than retail, uh, but you can just use the your your vehicle that you're in. A lot of the time, especially on uh, more fair weather days, I'll drill my holes so that I can sit in the front seat of my truck and just fish out of the door of the truck. And um, that really makes it easier to uh, run and gun, as they say, which is a way of just um, quickly fishing one little spot seeing if there's anything in the area. And if there isn't, then you can move easily without having to reset all of your, your tent and all your other equipment up. But there are luxurious ice castles out there that are many, many thousands of dollars um, to, yeah, home built shacks and all kinds of things like that. So there's really no limits as far as your, your shelter can go. When you're fishing with kids, you need lots of food, lots and lots and lots of food. My daughters will eat probably more food in a three hour ice fishing trip than they will in an entire week of school lunches. It's, it's crazy. So that's one of the first things they ask for when they get out on the ice. Um, and it's, it's fun to have special things that are just for ice fishing. So, um, as you can see in these pictures here, I, I'm not sure if you can, hmm, can you, can you kind of guess a theme in all of these things? Um, I don't, I don't really, I don't know. Um, should we do that? Should we ask for what you think the theme is? Um, anyway, <laughs> the, all of these items in these pictures are not sticky. So anytime that you have sticky foods, you're going to have to be wiping hands. And as soon as you wipe hands, they get cold. So dry snacks are definitely the best thing to be packing. So crackers and cheese and, you know, orange slices and little candies and treats, but nothing, nothing sticky or goopy because then it's just going to add to, to the cold of the situation. And there's a picture of my daughter. She's got her sucker and her lunch kit, and she's just the happiest little thing with her snackle box of, of goodies. Okay, so getting set up. Um, as you travel out to your spot, make sure you're taking your seatbelts off if you're in a vehicle. Um, if the worst case scenario were to happen, you want to be able to get out quick and having seatbelts on is definitely not going to help you with that. So, uh, younger kids, it's even best to have them on, on a lap of someone who's with you, um, and, uh, making sure that, uh, that yeah, everybody, nobody's strapped into the vehicle. As you're setting up, you're going to want to keep them warm and safe. Um, let them wait in the vehicle while you set up the tent and the heater and get the holes drilled um, or you're loading your gear. 
then you know exactly where they are. They're not running around and bonking their head on the tailgate or or slipping and falling or getting, you know, too rambunctious with each other. Um, it's just way better to keep them kind of like, yeah, keep them contained. <laughs> That's, um, and then, yeah, they're safe and they're warm and it mitigates a lot of issues before they can happen. Um, speaking of mitigating issues, always make sure you have a spare key on your person, whether that's on a lanyard or a safety pin inside your jacket. I like to put my lanyard um, through the loop in the back of my jacket um, that I don't even notice it, but I know that it's there if I need it because your kids absolutely will lock your doors on you. They will. Don't think they won't. They will. Um, and of course, once they're a little bit older or if they're already a, are a little older, um, you can assign them with age appropriate jobs um, and let them do what they can do. And then they're going to want to keep building on those skills. Even if it's a simple thing, um, they could hand you things, they could um, just move stuff around or um, yeah, just age appropriate jobs and get them involved in the experience. Oops, wrong direction. Sorry. Okay. Using your auger. Um, if you have a gas auger and you've never used one, make sure you try starting it at home. Um, know a little bit about how it works. Um, know what could, uh, know a little few of the troubleshooting tips and uh, yeah, practice, practice starting it. Um, with the electric stuff, there's a little bit less of that learning curve to, to deal with. But again, you're going to have to make sure your batteries are staying warm. And uh, it, it's still a good idea to practice using it and getting familiar with it before you head out on the ice. Um, as you're drilling your holes, you wanna consider the current. So if you're in a river or anywhere with flowing water, the lines of course are gonna be taken along with the current. So line up your holes across the current instead of with it, and then you'll avoid tangles big time. Um, as you're drilling your hole, let the auger blades do the work and don't push down. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I see new people doing is they will push and push and push. And then as soon as it breaks through at the bottom, boom, they are almost on their face and they are confused. And <laughs> it's, it seems pretty obvious after you've done a few, but that, that first breakthrough is an eye opener for people. So definitely don't be pushing down and make sure that you're letting the auger do the work. As you're drilling, especially in thicker ice, make sure that you're clearing out the hole with the slush by lifting up on the auger every 10 inches or so. Um, the ice can and the slush can refreeze fairly quickly, especially in those super sub uh, temperatures, and the flight of your auger can get stuck in the hole. And that's an absolute nightmare when that happens. Um, it's much more common when the ice is thicker, like that four and a half feet mark that we get out here. Um, and you're in an ex use an extension and you're starting that auger above your head. And <laughs> that's that's like March Lake Winnipeg fishing. Um, it's it's fun, but you definitely have to make sure that you're clearing your hole or you could end up without a flight going home. Make sure that your feet are shoulder width apart and you have a strong sort of stance as you're as you're drilling. And if there's bare ice, make sure you have uh, fleets on your boots to to hold yourself steady because the torque on that auger can spin you around. Uh, waterproof boots are of course best. As you pull the, the auger back up, once you break through, a big sluice of water is gonna come up that hole and uh, you're probably gonna be getting water on, on your feet. So in order to stay dry the longest, make sure that your, your boots are, are waterproof or that you're standing and kind of aware of where that's gonna be splashing so that you're not soaked for the rest of your day. Kid-friendly gear, <laughs> it's not your $200 combo because chances are, especially when they're super little, nothing's gone like, or, 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 you know, things happen. So, um, a good way to is, is like I said, the hockey stick rods are great for kids. Um, there are a bunch of un inexpensive options on the market. Um, but, uh, another way to get, um, rods and build up your uh, gear arsenal is through the kidfish derby or other derbies where but this one's spe specifically 
um, is a $30 ticket to get in. And the first 600 kids through the door get a free rod reel combo that they it's ready to go. They can use it that day. Um, and and it's it's really exciting for them to end up with something that is specifically theirs. Um, I find that's a really good uh, thing with, with fishing with kids in general is that they have ownership over their stuff, their gear, because then that gives them um, the, the sense that it's something for them that they do instead of just something that's, you know, that they can use. Um, and having that ownership or that sense of ownership really gets them more into the, the activity. Um, yeah, a lot of these, the, the kid-friendly gear is more set it and forget it. Some kids will like to dig or move their li line around and, and some will just like to watch uh, while they do other activities. And um, it's it's just... Yeah, there's there's all kinds of options. It, it really depends on on your kid, the age, their interest level, um, all of that. And uh, a lot of the times, if you have electronics or flashers, that sort of thing, they're going to be drawn into that um, part of of the activity, and they're going to want to um, see what their lure is doing and be more involved in in jigging when they can see what's going on. Uh, jaw jackers and other hook setters are are really good for kids too because then it's more likely of getting that hook up without having to worry about them setting the hook properly pickerel rigs are great like i said before um, and you can use them with a bobber as a strike indicator um, and then you're going to be ending up reeling like hand lining it in um, and if you're ending up doing that especially again with the hockey stick um, line you're, there is no reel. You're just going to be pulling in the line. A safety thing there is don't wrap it around your hand, especially with big fish, because it can cut you. So, yeah, just a little safety thing there. Um, keep your line kind of in in within your area and um, in in a, ca a careful manner so it doesn't get super tangled up. Jigging a minnow is a really great thing for kids too. It's pretty simple. You can use, depending on obviously your regulations in your area, live or dead minnows um, or plastics. Um, we're seeing really great results with plastics this year as in our lake. Um, some years prior haven't uh, had much luck with plastics, but somehow this year they're doing really well. Um, and again, according to different rules in different areas, you can use uh, stinger hooks, which is a little additional hook um, that kind of dangles a little behind or towards the bottom of the bait where if the fish are sort of just testing and nipping and gently biting then you have a better chance of of hooking up with those fish um, especially for kids and uh, if they're just jiggling around not necessarily going to be the best at setting the hook and uh, yeah classic spoons still reliably catch fish red and whites five of diamonds plain gold silver um big gold spoons are are really good producing uh lure and here's a picture of my best rod ever my hockey stick there that's one that i had as a kid i still use it today and you can see i got a bobber sitting in there as a strike indicator Okay, so when you're out there, what gets cold first and what is going to send you home the fastest? So I'm not sure about you, but for me, it's my feet. Um, but not anymore because I've solved that problem with really good boots. So warm feet is more time fishing. Um, you can use cornstarch or foot powder before putting your socks on. That will absorb, absorb the moisture and uh, keep your feet drier. You might not even necessarily realize that your feet are getting sweaty, um, but it's especially when you're setting up, you're walking around, you're getting everything going. It's it's actually really easy to build up a sweat and then very suddenly you're cold and you're trying to figure out why. Well, chances are it's because your feet uh, got a little bit wet during, during the setup. Um, I like heat socks brand uh, socks. They're really warm. Um, you don't want to put on too many layers of socks either. Some people think, oh, I'll just like put on five layers and I'll be warm. It's quite the opposite. Putting on too many layers will restrict your blood flow in your feet. 
and uh, will make you cold faster. So boots, I really like Nats boots. There's a few really good brands out there. Baffins are really good too. Um, but your standard, say Walmart boot that says minus 30, it's not a minus 30 boot. There's um, definitely better for ice fishing than that. Um, and if you're going to be doing a lot of it, invest in something that's going to really work. Like I said, the, the Nats and the Baffins are probably some of the best ones out there. Uh, if anybody listening has any other suggestions on really dependable boots, I would love to hear. And you can share that information in the chat. But uh, that's that's my preference that I found. Um, the Nats boots I found are just also very, very light. So if you're walking any kind of distance, um, it's it really helps your energy levels throughout the course of the day. Uh, I used to have some steel-toed winter boots and they were quite heavy um and although they kept me super super warm by the end of the day i was exhausted from just lugging my boots around so switching over to something really light like the nats has um, been a really big game changer actually um, for kids make sure that their boots actually fit them properly and they're not too tight again tight equals cold if they have the removable liners make sure you take them out the night before you go fishing make sure they're dried out completely um, it's never fun to start your day with damp or wet boots. Uh, there's the old granny trick. Okay, so granny tricks work. Um, and the granny trick of the bread bag. So they take up absolutely no room in your packing system. Always have a, a set of bread bags with you. Um, you can add them on to um, your over top of dry socks if you do get wet um, if you find out that your boots are are leaking if you know that they're leaking or that they have a potential to get wet put them on even before you leave as that extra barrier um, and yeah sorry um, and another trick for say you can't necessarily get the best boots for your kiddo but you're going to go anyway you can take out one of those styrofoam meat trays and cut out the shape of the the foot or the bottom the inside of the boot put that in the boot underneath the liner and that'll give you that extra little eighth or so inch of space between your foot and the ice which can actually make a big difference in the length of time that you can stay out there and keep your feet off the ice whenever possible so in whatever way that works for you there's those puzzle foam like mats um that you see a lot of the time people will build even whole floors for their tents out of those things um you can just throw if you have a backpack or if you have a chunk of firewood or the um the, the floor mats out of your car whatever you have handy is going to be better than just having your feet straight onto the ice Okay, so your feet are cold. Now what? Get moving. Um, our bodies have this uh, self-defense mechanism built in where if our core temperature starts to drop, we will start to pull heat from our extremities as a survival method. So getting up moving, getting your core temperature back up is a really good way for you to increase your circulation and uh, get uh, the blood flowing and getting warmed up back in those in your fingers and toes. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but take your boots off, especially if you have like, uh, you're in your shelter, you got your heat on and, uh, you're, you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm still cold, but the heat's on, take those boots off, see if your socks are wet. Um, and then you have a chance to rub your hands with or uh, rub your feet with your hands, get your circulation going and, uh, potentially dry out those boots. Um, you can put on, obviously, you should have dry socks with you. Put heat backs in there, but make sure that you put them on the tops of your toes. Um, I suggested at one point to someone to use the heat packs, and they said, oh, I can't do that. It's so uncomfortable to walk on them. And I'm going, okay, but have, have you put them on the tops of your toes? You don't have to walk on them for them to actually be keeping you warm. So that is um, probably a, a really helpful Thing that some people have the misconception of, of where to put those heat backs if you're going to be using them. Of course, yeah, dry socks. And try to 
warm up your boots if you need to. I think I've talked about that part already a little bit. And yeah, cold feet, especially when it's kiddos, um, prepare to maybe cut your day short if you need to. Um, there's no point in suffering out there. Uh, there's no point in making anyone miserable because a miserable kiddo is not going to want to go back with you the next time. As you're out there fishing, let the kids play. Let them touch things. Let them, uh, you know, be supervised, obviously, but let them be in there. Um, live minnows are a really great chance for kids to have uh, experienced just feeling how a fish moves, um, seeing what it does, those sorts of things. And it's a lot less intimidating than a full-size fish. So it's just a, a really good entry um, to that experience without it being too much for them. And let them poke at home too. Um, these are a couple of walleyes that we took home for supper and my girls were investigating the eyes and investigating just yeah the fish in general so we always make sure that that's an option if they want to check it out hands-on is the best way to learn so just show them what to do and let them go let them have that experience let them build their own confidence and learn that they can do it because yes confidence is built by doing. I was so impressed with these two ladies. Um, this was at a, a derby that we went to and they pulled all the gear, including my little one who decided she absolutely needed to have a ride. <laughs> so showing themselves and showing you how capable they are is definitely an awesome part of the experience. Take lots of photos, videos, and capture those memories. Sneak, um, and I guess this slide is a good point to, you'll, you obviously can see I got, um, my daughter has her tablet there with her. So she's got it, but she's at this point not paying any attention to it. She's watching her lure on the flasher and um, she's got her ring pop and she's having a great time. Um, at one point in this uh, this trip, she I asked her, I said, are you having a good time, Alex? And she goes, mom, you're kind of bothering me right now. I'm focused. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's fun how just give them the options and uh, let them kind of figure out their day the way that it's going to make them happy. And just, yeah, a few more pictures of fishes and you know, with the puppy dogs out there and lots of different things to explore and discover and like when they catch their first and like any fish really but especially when they're catching their first fish they, those smiles are unbeatable gotta have pictures okay so you're you're fishing and you caught a fish now what do you do um of course sharp good quality hooks are going to increase your chances of a successful hookup on a fish bigger hooks for bigger fish smaller for smaller fish it's not a hard and fast rule but it definitely helps um, you're less likely to lose big fish with bigger hooks. Uh, smaller hooks can just rip through um, and uh, and they can get away. So making sure that your your quality hooks are sized appropriately to your target species is, is important. Um, as you are reeling in a fish, you're going to want to hold your rod level to the ice and use the backbone of the rod or the rod itself to keep the tension on the line. You don't want to point the rod at the hole or down the hole as the fish pulls because then there is no tension on that line and they have a good chance of just giving it a head shake and removing that hook from their mouth. Um, you're going to want to align the fish and in order to get it up the hole, I've seen people get so excited that they've caught a fish that they just try to pull it right through the ice <laughs> instead of waiting for it to line up with the hole. And that usually results in a snapped line and a whole lot of grrr kind of words. So um, it's it's definitely a quick learning experience when it happens to you, but um, avoiding it in the first place is definitely uh, definitely better. So take your time. Um, make sure that, uh, especially with bigger fish, because they can fill that full eight inch hole, um, that your the head is aligned up the hole um, and you, yeah, take your time because the, the ice edges and or the ice surface as they come up can dislodge the hook and your fish will get away. 
And then you're ready for year round adventures. Um, there's, like I said before, there's nearly unlimited water bodies to explore and there's no limit on the experiences you can have. Derbies and events, uh, as I mentioned, the Kidfish Derby, they're just really good ways to get out there, um, see the fishing community, be part of it, meet the people, um, support great causes, win prizes, get together with other fishing families. I highly recommend getting involved in derbies. The, the chances of winning things are technically usually fairly slim, depending on the derby and the attendance, but they're lots of fun. There's lots of different activities for the kids to do most of the time. Um, there's music and just a lighthearted, fun kind of atmosphere for most of these events. And of course, they're always looking for volunteers. So if you have the chance to volunteer for a derby, that can be a really great way of introducing yourself to the sport. So another Manitoba specific um, piece of information here. So we have the Manitoba Master Angler Program. Um, I think there's a few other places that have similar programs, but it's kind of like the real life Pokemon game where you got to catch them all. Uh, kids really love to do that. Um, adults too, of course. Uh, it's your record of your trophy fish throughout your angling career. So you usually will get a certificate. You can earn badges. Uh, in Manitoba, we have 30 different qualifying species for uh, for Master Angler Program. And uh, it's it's a lifetime of, of potential achievements there. Um, there are different awards for catching say uh, you can specialize in a species by getting five trophy fish of that species and then uh, as you get trophy fish in different species you will go from um, bronze silver gold platinum up through the, uh, the the master angler program um this is i mentioned at the beginning um how i think i did anyway how we use a um, fish score conversion chart for our events so this puts all the different fish at a common denominator and allows them to compete against each other. So a really big for a perch, perch will beat uh, in score a average size pike every day. So it um, kind of takes out the, um, uh, I don't know, I lost my word there, but it kind of takes out the species specific um, factor of fishing and oh well mine's bigger oh well but but is it though so um, this is really great for fun family derbies or any kind of event really um, this is from the Manitoba Wildlife Federation and of course fishing isn't all about fishing um, it's about fun it's about getting outside it's about exploring and there's lots of different things that you can do when the fish aren't biting um, Years like this year where there's a lot of just bare ice exposed, we like to take our ice skates and uh, my girls have learned to skate out on the lake, which is a lot of fun. And uh, you can create all kinds of different games. Um, we, you can do snow block tosses. Sometimes if there's enough snow and it's mushy, you can um, make snowmen. And there's just so many different things that you can do to enjoy your time out there that aren't specific to fishing. So if you have one person in your crew who's maybe not as focused on that than than others then they can uh, still enjoy themselves <laughs> and get outside while you're outside it's so easy to get sucked into just staring at your screen whether that's your flasher or your phone um and you, it's unfortunately easy to just be a, a screen zombie in the dark in your tent but uh that's that's not what you're there for you're there to get outside to explore to see the new spaces that you're in um so just make sure you're enjoying the sunshine because that's where all the nature therapy actually comes from and yeah just a few different ideas of things that you can do to keep yourselves busy or add to your day of adventure um and yeah lots of fun things of course, fishing with friends is always more fun. You can create little villages if you like out there, have a cooking tent or um, other way, yeah, barbecues. And it's there's like no limit to how you can build on your day. Don't be afraid to modify your gear too. Um, 
these two pictures were the same lure and the uh, left side there that's how it came and it would have attached where my thumb is but I flipped it around I added a swivel I added a little jingle bell and a treble hook so um, that's just one example of how you can modify of course make sure that you're following the rules for your area there are definitely um, limits on the number of hooks that you can have per line and, and that sort of things so um, just yeah be aware of those but it's not against the rules to change your lures and uh, yeah if you're in Manitoba there is a modification that is absolutely required and that is to remove the barbs from your hook and in this picture here they are not removed that's because I just put it together so yeah they uh you definitely need to remove your barbs so yeah make sure it's fun fun is the goal fish are the bonus and fun is different for each person so yeah plan uh, build your excitement ahead of time be prepared there are all kinds of things that can happen. Um, and yeah, like I said before, preparedness is going to mitigate a lot of those issues. Um, when you're a really first timer, it's a really good idea to go with somebody you know who is experienced. And if you don't know somebody personally, hire a guide or an outfit outfitter, um, or you can rent a shack that's already getting set up for you so that you can have a chance to learn firsthand from those experienced people. And 99.9% of the time, they're not going to take you anywhere unsafe, especially those licensed guides and outfitters. Their entire lifeline or life is on the line um, as well as yours. So they are not going to be taking you anywhere that they shouldn't be. So that's a really good um, option for just getting out there in, uh, in a, to test it out and see if ice fishing is something that you want to pursue a little bit more. Um, fishing with kids can be more fair weather, time sensitive. Don't overdo it. Again, like um, if they're if they're miserable by the end, they're not going to want to go back. So always uh, make sure that they're they're having the best time that they can, and secure your phone and your keys so they don't go down the hole. Um, there's constantly posts about uh, asking to borrow magnets or asking to borrow cameras because phones and keys have been going down um, to the bottom quite often um, you don't want that to be you it's not a fun experience so uh, have those secured lanyards are really good there's uh, different phone holder devices you can find on amazon really easily just make sure that your phone is warm so that the battery doesn't die um, and that it's secured Yeah, make sure you're ending your trip on a positive note, as I was saying before, and leave no trace. Anything that you take out there absolutely will fit in your uh, your your system, your sleigh, your whatever. Anything you take out, you can take back. Um, do not leave any trash on the ice. Uh, unfortunately, there is always going to be people who do that. Uh, I'm one of those people who takes an extra bag or like garbage bag with me, and I will clean up shorelines, and I will stop and pick up trash when I see it. So um, I encourage you to be one of those people as well. Um, it's never fun to come across those sorts of situations. Uh, and of course, um, if you see people actively littering, it's, you know, see something, say something, they are going to probably be mean to you about it. And you'll probably end up taking their trash with you, but um, at least they know they've been seen. So yeah, it's always important to just make sure that we are protecting our spaces. Um, uh, when I first kind of uh, told my husband that I was going to be doing this presentation, he said, well, but Watersheds Canada, they're all about protecting natural spaces. Isn't fishing kind of counterintuitive to that? And I said, well, no, but fishing and anglers, anglers are people who really appreciate the, the resources that they get to use. There, there's people who go out there and, and leave a mess. Well, I wouldn't rest, necessarily call them anglers. Those are just, you know, weekend warrior kind of guys or people. But uh, anglers, true anglers, will always respect the resource that they use, as most people do with uh, with what's important to them. So, yeah, be be a nature protector. Make sure you're leaving nothing behind. Uh, that's kind of it. So this is back to my contact card. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, 
And I can open the floor to questions now, I guess. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that great presentation, Erin. I just wanted to take a moment to let everybody know about our survey. So Monica will drop the link in the chat. And the survey just helps us understand what you enjoyed today and some more topics that you're interested in hearing about in the future. And don't forget to register for our upcoming webinar next week and to keep an eye out for the handout that's coming in your inbox. And I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of their day. I hope you learned something. <laughs> Thank you.